you know, and, and uh, according to the Bible, you know, a thousand years is like one day to our God, so it's only, only been a couple of days. So we have to be patient with His timing. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, it, you know, but the, since since he died on the cross, yeah, it's about two thousand two days, you know, a couple of days, a couple of days. So we have, we have we have we have to be patient. Is this see, that's the thing. So when we focus on the when, we run out of patience. Yeah, but when we focus on where is the kingdom of God, time is too short. There a lot of work needs to be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. I mean, the, the, this is why Jesus said the harvest is great. We need, uh, you know, uh, laborers. You know, uh, there, there are a lot of things that we need to do right now. God is good, really. Right. Said, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, what is it? Well, uh, you know, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't have to my father, but I have this kind of patience for you. Right. I, you know, there, there are times that I am so thankful that God is in my humble opinion, delaying the time yeah, yeah. because, yeah. you know, I still have my relatives, yeah. my in-laws, exactly. you know, they are, they, are, they are doing much better than last five years, but still, you know, yeah. yeah. And I don't want to lose them. Yeah. Really, I don't. They never late in this Yeah, yeah. It's just Right. I mean, uh, when, I, when my wife and I were baptized, my father disowned us. He, he said, uh, if, you, if you join the Adventist church, because in his mind, it, it, was, it was cult. In a, in a career, in an Adventist church was uh, very much labeled as a cult. And my father was uh, a police chief in the uh, city of Chongyang Li, where our uh, 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 hospital was there, and, uh, and then the church was there. So he had an experience with our church when he was policeman in the community and uh, some of the experience was not all that positive and uh, so he had this negative connotation with the you know, church name so when my wife and I decided to uh, uh, be baptized and become a service adventist and, and be, be a pastor you know he, he thought that I lost my mind and, and so he said if you do that then you'll be out the door we'll be no longer you know and uh, he, he didn't talk to us for 10 years Oh. Ten years, we we sent for, you know letters, and he returned without even bother to open them up. And uh, we call, he hang up, you know, all the time. And uh, uh, I sent the pictures of our children, didn't care. Uh, but it took ten years. Uh, but Holy Spirit continually worked in his heart. See, that's the thing. You know, all, sometimes we just have to, you know, faithful to his timing. Mm-hmm. And and uh, when when you know when time comes, he will you know uh, answer our prayer. But we just want to you know answer right away, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, but after ten years, uh, make a long story short, two thousand one, you know, uh, we were reconnect. And uh, since then, every year, you know, he take a whole family, you know, to a vacation. He pays, you know. <laughs> I say it's time to pay all the pain that you caused. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yes, yeah, so somebody has. Let me show you this video clip. This is actually it's on our website. Oh, by the way, uh, let me show you. Uh, let, me, let me show you the video clip first. This is Paradise Valley Church. Paradise Valley Church. You, you probably re- remember the story. The Ellen G. White said there is water in this desert. We need to uh, build a sanatorium. Yeah, San Diego. Yeah, and the uh, 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 church brethren said there is no water in this desert. You know. Make her own story. She, she went out and got the money and bought the land, and uh, they got those water, you know, and they built the hospital. And, uh, and the church was there, you know, predominantly Caucasian, but this community is now 90% you know, or more you know, uh, uh, immigrants and refugees. So, church had to do something for their community, you know, immigrants and refugees. And, and it was actually, uh, you know, I, I say this without apology, but it was a dying church. But now, the church is vibrant. Uh, they have like uh, seven different languages that translate every sermon. Uh, yeah, and the church is open every day, not just once a week. You know, they now have a strict ministry hiring, you know, uh, well, they don't actually. The refugees have to have job experience. You know, uh, within the first six months, you have to learn the language. You know, you have to be involved in some sort of a job experience program. 
and this is what they did. Amazing. Watch this. San Diego is a beautiful city on the Pacific Ocean at the southern tip of California. It is also home to a growing population of refugee families that have fled from religious or political persecution, seeking a safe haven and a new start at life. When they arrive in the United States from countries like Burma, Laos, Iraq, Sudan, and Rwanda, most do not speak English and have very little but the clothes on their back. The Paradise Valley Seventh-day Adventist Church in San Diego County recognized the great need in their community and began an immigrant and refugee ministry. It's the refugee capital of America right now. There are 90,000 refugees here in San Diego and they are lonely, they need so much love, they've, they've left their family behind, they don't know anybody here, and they respond to love. The church distributes over 7,000 pounds of food each week to nearly 500 families. They also have developed a community garden to provide fresh produce for the refugee families and to help them cope with the depression they may struggle with from missing home or devastating news of loved ones. The Paradise Valley Church, an affiliate of Adventist Community Services, embodies the mission of ACS to serve the community in Christ's name. ACS is made up of a family of ministries, community development. The audio, I guess. Oh, this thing died? Paradise. Oh. Yeah. Me. I'm going to buy a uh, Made in Korea next time. <laughs> they lead individualized ESL classes, supplemented with computers and software-based learning programs. They are working with young people and adults to teach them English and help them develop the skills to thrive independently. The aim of Paradise Valley's immigrant and refugee ministry is to care for others and reflect the love of God within their community. This demonstrated compassion has resulted in a vibrant, growing church with more than 100 people over the last two years giving their lives to God. Every church needs to have a ministry that is relevant not only to the members, but to the community in which they live in. We're here to impact our community and to make a difference for eternity. Touching one heart, one family, one community, we can transform the world. You can make a difference today through your financial contributions to Adventist Community Services. Amen. Oh, sorry, you know, lost some sound. I need to get a better one. It was on sale at the Amazon, and you get what you pay for. Uh, but that Paradise Valley Church, as I said, you know, got involved with this refugee and the immigrant in our uh, ministry. And I tell you, uh, last couple of years, they baptized about 100. Last five years, over 350. And, and, and uh, guess what? The church members are adopting a family. The church, church family is adopting a family and walking them through, you know, how to go to grocery store and buy things, how to get a license, how to open up the bank account, you know, how to send the children to the school. So those things, you know, uh, when, when, when you are newly you know, arrived in this country, you don't know, you don't have that information. Mm -hmm. is that we, we used to joke about it in Korean church. You know, you, your future, your occupation uh, is determined you know, uh, uh, depends on someone who met you at the airport. So, uh, so, so it's like someone who's picking you up from the, you know, uh, airport is, a, let's say, a restaurant owner, you end up working at the restaurant. <laughs> if a person is a laundry mat owner, you will end up working at the laundry mat, you know. So we used to joke about that. But it's a serious, it's, it's a reality we're dealing with. And so we have to really figure it out how to help these immigrants and the refugee ministry, uh, refugees coming to our country, especially like you said, San Francisco. I think this is uh, one of the capitals, right? Immigrants and the refugees in the United States. So they're yeah, not just undocumented. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when people are not un undocumented, let's make it documented. <laughs> that would be good. Here, Michael Holton, he said, the ministry of the church as an institution or embassy instituted by Christ should be identified by preaching, baptizing, 
and communing and uh, teaching everything Christ delivered. Christ is where disciples are made. Church. Church is where disciples are made. Worldly vocations are where disciples are sent. Is that true? So we have to have that in mind. We have to keep educating our church members that they are not just coming to church once a week and participate in religious you know, uh, uh, ritual. They are you know, disciples to make a difference in this community and, and the world. So we have to keep challenge them with that bigger picture. The most of the 30s and 40s in our church today, you know, they, they don't feel the, the significance, you know, the importance of their contribution. Because, you know, first of all, we don't even, you know, allow them to be leader of the church or, you know, uh, initiative ministries. Uh, so we really have to change the way of thinking and the way of working in our ministries. Uh, so create a platform that where people can interact, engage in a, uh, intentionally. You have to look for ways to you know, involve with the community uh, agencies. And uh, uh, I mean, I got a phone call from a lady who say, yeah, we like to do a soup kitchen, and uh, we need some financial support from the division. And I said, do you have any facility at your church that you can do? I said, no, we don't even have a, any kitchen. I said, is there any uh, soup kitchens in your community? And she said, yeah, there, you know, there are like a Salvation Army soup kitchen from two blocks from us, and uh, there's, a web, you know, there's another you know, uh, soup kitchen, you know, uh, uh, like a, I guess a quarter mile in south and so forth. Uh, she said, but this is really the need of this community. We really need to have uh, you know, our own. And at, I'm hearing all this, and I said at the end, you know, it costs a lot of money to have soup kitchen ministry. Why not? Why not go to Salvation on your soup kitchen and work with them? Amen. Why not go down to you know a quarter mile and work with the Presbyterian Church? Volunteer that with them. And this lady was so upset with me. She actually called me a hypocrite. She said, she called me over the phone and said, "You are a hypocrite. You are a, you, you 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 cannot be you know uh, uh, director of North American Division ACS with that attitude." You know, uh, um, well, yeah, well, you know, like she, she, thought, she, she thought that I was like, you know, uh, but I was very sincere. Why not? What, what's wrong with us working with, you know, Salvation Army, you know, at the soup kitchen and the Presbyterian food pantry? How, how are you going to share the good news if you don't mingle with the people in your community, right? Why? Everything has to be our own. Yeah. It costs a lot of less to go volunteer down the road. Amen. <laughs> I can share experience where uh, some youth from uh, Southern, they got, um, they, they, they went to New York and somehow they started working with the Presbyterian Church. And uh, these, these youth, they were in so into evangelism. Uh, they're just into social sure. help. And, and uh, they were working with this Pres Presbyterian Church, feeding the homeless and so on. And at the end of the day, um, the, the head of the department, he came, sat us down in the circle, and he says, I know you guys are all at this. Uh -huh. And he says, you know, I study your message, and you guys have the truth. Mm -hmm. And you guys need to keep preaching that truth. And mm. keep telling it. And keep on. And he's like, yeah, I, I need to become an Adventist like today, today right mm. now. And if we did not go to that Presbyterian church. You would never have that opportunity. We would never have seen that opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And Witness exactly, exactly. It's okay to work with the Gentiles. <laughs> it's okay to work with other denominations. Amen. Pastor Mark. Well, I think a lot of times people have an idea and they don't know how much it's working to be. Mm -hmm. Like at our church, anybody who has an idea that's mm -hmm. already been done in the community, ask people mm -hmm. to help them out for six months. Mm -hmm. oh, you know, whether it's that's a drug rehab mm -hmm. or prostitutes off the street, yeah. homeless ministry, whatever, because mm -hmm. San Francisco has so much of this resource, and everybody's like, well, we got to do it. And it's like they all want to just kind of reinvent the wheel. Yeah, and there's no need for that. The homeless people sleep in the church. I'm like, okay, you go down and work for a year with, I like, tell them where to go, and they go down, and then they realize, you know, a lot of times these homeless people, it takes a lot of work to have the boundary. You just can't give them a key to the church. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. What it does is they get on-the-job training that way. Exactly, exactly. This is why we need to, you know, 
uh, encourage our church members to be engaged in community civic organizations, whatever that you know, person has a passion for, whether it's a domestic violence, a substance abuse, you know, elder care, housing issue, whatever that is, we need to you know, be connected. You know, and and you, I, I, I'll be honest with you, your eyes will be opened up. Mm-hmm. You will see the whole, you know, a different aspects of the community. Mm-hmm. And you will begin to realize that we're, we're not the only vegetarian in the whole world. There's a lot more out there. Amen? So we need to work with them. And, and this is why the church cannot just focus on, you know, uh, being successful in numbers. You know, sometimes we get caught up with this denominational you know, competition and you know, act like in you know, a Greek minds. You know, I'm right, therefore you must be wrong type of thing and, and they have this crusade mentality and you know, chop down everyone who are against you and have a different beliefs. And that, you know, is not helping here. We have to be influential, you know. And God says we are the salt and the light of the world. You know, to be influencer, we have to have a faithful presence in our community. If you just go to your community and once a year with a Thanksgiving basket, hello, what influence do you have? Amen? Yeah. You really have to, you know, commit it consistently, you know, being engaged and involved so that people will know you. You know, pastors, you should join like a Rotary Club, chain in a, uh, a Chamber of Commerce. You know, or, or if you don't have any interest like that, join like a Rotary Club or I mean, Alliance, Kwanis. They got lots, yeah, yeah, opportunities out there. You got to mingle with the people who are, you know, sharing the same conviction, so that when you are faithful and then people see you again and again and again, they begin to understand you are genuine. And when when you are, you know. Uh, I'm sorry, I say this without apology. You really have to earn your salvation in public eyes. And, and when you do that, then you will one day have a right to share the good news that we have. The first thing you have to do is to demonstrate your commitment and build that trust relationship. This is why you know, I, I believe the church is like a conductor, you know, with the, uh, like orchestra conductor. You, we don't have all the resources out there you know, I wish we did, but we don't in reality. So we have to connect the resources in our community. You know, connect the public sector, business sector, and like, like this church in El Paso, Texas, that connect the business, you know, with undocumented people. That's our role, you know. But somehow, you know, we, we, we don't see beyond. Uh, this is actually uh, what Chip Sweeney, Pastor Chip Sweeney said. Um, Sometimes we just study. We just study, 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 and, 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 and we end up having a big head. <laughs> and that head is not connected to our heart. We don't have any passion. And, and our heart is not connected to hands. There's no external you know, ministry, that community outreach ministry. As I said, you know, 90% or more you know, churches are doing you know, ministries that just benefit their church members, not the community in by and large. So we have to be connect them all. This is what George Bonner said, that the people are not going to patronize an institution which appears incapable of living what it preaches. Amen? Yeah, you have to walk the walk and talk the talk. And you cannot say, I, you know, we have a concern for you know, people's well-being and, and, and then you know, do nothing about it. And Ellen Dwight said, health message is the right arm for the you know, gospel ministry, you know. But we talk about that. But what happened to the rest of the body? <laughs> um, yeah, so we have to really uh, uh, uni- unified as an organization in working with all generations. We have to be inclusive, all ages and gender. You know, we have to create this, you know, uh, safe environment for people to engage with innovative ideas and, and the new strategies. You have to create the safe environment at the church. But sometimes, you know, we want more of a uniformity rather than you know, unity with the vision. And, and, and one size fit all type, and this is what we've been doing for the last 10,000 years, and this is what we're going to do for the next 10,000 years. Now, that concept doesn't work that well. So, 
in, in order to unify your church members, you really have to create it, a safe environment for people to fully engage in a very, with the innovative ideas and uh, uh, new concepts of a community outreach ministry, and not just focusing on the, you know, like relief. And also, understand your community. You have to understand their environment. Sometimes we go to the community with the preconceived notion, you know, we think this is what they are in need of. You know, we don't even conduct any new assessment. Yeah, the survey, meeting with the people in the community, talking to the, you know, all this, you know, public sector business people in our community. What are the struggles? You know, this pastor in El Paso, Texas, you know, being a Rotarian, talking to the business people, <coughs> begin to understand the problem, right? And talking to the you know, public sector, uh, begin to understand we have an you know, immigration problem. So you have to be out there and understand your environment. Just coming to the church once a week, you know, that doesn't make you uh, informed, you know, leader in our community. So make sure. And then also identify key makers, because like I said, uh, key change makers. There are many like-minded people out there. They may not call themselves Adventists, but they could be Baptist or, you know, Presbyterian or just, you know, simply uh, 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 the responsible citizen who has a concern for, you know, betterment of our community. So meet these individuals out there in your community and, and begin to share your passion, begin to share and, and you know, uh, some sort of a commitment. <laughs> and when you hear their cry, perhaps, you know, you, you will hear from them what you can do. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the key factor is you, you have to create you know, a safe environment for people to engage and go out there and, and understand the community that you're dealing with and meet you know, the shakers and the movers in your community. And it's okay. <laughs> to hang out there. Uh, 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 I mean, I will show you a quotation tomorrow, but uh, when, I, when I said that before, someone said that to me. Ellen Dewey said, you know, we cannot, you know, uh, 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 mingle with, you know, sinners and, and so forth. So I said, you know, show me, show me where she said that, you know, because she never said things like that. But we sometimes, you know, make our own Ellen Dewey statement. <laughs> And, <laughs> and yeah, in, in fact, she, she said in a testimony uh, to a minister's uh, volume nine, uh, that even idolaters, even idolaters do not refuse, you know, do not refuse them based on, on that account. Because what she's saying, entire, you know, the, the chapter, it, it's, it's, it's like we are giving them opportunity to serve. You see where she's coming from? Yeah. We're not, we're not here to just serve them, but we are creating opportunity for others to serve God and His people. And, and we are simply becoming the conduit. And so we have to have that kind of broad mindset. I mean, that's what I like about her you know, and, and her writings. It really, really challenges us. Even idolaters. It, it was all related to the funding. I, I, I'll show you uh, uh, tomorrow, because I have it in the slide. Actually, I have last three slides. She even says, even worldly men, you know, uh, do not refuse based on their account. But anyway, so lead by engagement. You have to engage. You know, you cannot tell your parishioners to engage in community outreach ministry without you being engaged. You know, one of the reasons why I'm doing, you know, the chaplaincy for Civil Air Patrol is first, my son is interested in, you know, Air Force. He wants to become, you know, officer. He wants to go to Air Force Academy. So he wants to do this cadet program. So it's good for my, you know, father and son bonding, right? Because so I'm, I'm, I, I want to spend my time with him. And second thing is, I'm preaching and teaching about people being involved to do, you know, community uh, service. So, hey. As myself, I'm demonstrating it as a chaplain, you know. So you as a pastor, I'm sorry to say this, but uh, you know, there's no other way. You cannot lead your congregation without you being involved first. You know what, uh, you're telling us that we have to work with the Gentiles. Yeah. And you know what, just two months ago, uh -huh. uh, public objects. Hey. Uh, there is a religious organization hey. that would like to offer 
their services to us. Oh. We are doing this community services. Amen. We would like to partner with us. Good deal. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, it so happened that the, 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 the place of worship oh, yeah. was demolished. And they said, we would like to partner with you, but we would like also to use your church as our place of worship on hmm. Sunday and, and, and Tuesday. This is that we need to adjust with your, with your, yeah. with your, with your schedule. Right. And then we discuss it, the board approved it, uh -huh. but during the business meeting we will present it to, to the congregation. Right. The no one for just one vote. Ah. And uh, we cannot, cannot just uh, afford to accommodate it. But I mentioned the name of Pastor Mark to contact him right. because we might also use our cabinet as the place of worship. Okay. Yeah. But you know, uh, everyone is... Uh, is uh, encouraging us to to work with the Gentiles. Yes. So after I found and, and the writer is very quiet yeah. that she said we have to help these people also because to the start with we are renting their facilities. Yeah we do. And we do that. Said, we have to open them yeah. to our church so that we can also minister to them. I know I, I, we, we have a very interesting no, no, we're not allowed to use our facility. Yeah, we, we seem to forget. This, this Korean congregation, we used to rent the Methodist church for worship service, and then we end up you know, buying a, a church, and uh, the Methodist church wants to, uh, this is another Methodist congregation, wants to uh, use our facility on Sunday. And uh, uh, soon we forgot about how we were blessed mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and said, oh, they will bring, you know, problems and we cannot allow. That's a sad. And then we have also said that during mm. the time of persecution when we cannot buy ourselves, these people that we help, they will also help us. Like you know we serve <laughs> in the wilderness, yeah. we go to the promised land, the what the name of that group? You know I I I say yeah I I Yeah I usually say you know we brought persecution unto ourselves. <laughs> 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 the way we should treat them, you know. Yeah, I wonder why we're not you know, persecuted. I mean, and then, then we focus on like leaving the city, go to the you know, mountain, be calling and hide. Are you kidding me? Oh, my goodness. I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, my question. Go, go to the mountain. <laughs> uh, about worshiping on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, they come to our church and worship on Sunday. Uh, do we have, we have a responsibility to let them know the truth. Yeah. Because the right worship is a, or Sabbath is a, is a Sunday. Sure. Uh, we as missionaries go out there and tell people that the right Sabbath is Saturday. Right. Uh, that's difficult. And if we allow them to practice in our church, right. do you think there's a conflict there? No, <laughs> you know, it, 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 to, to me, let me, uh, let me answer this way. This is my humble opinion. You know, you know this is not absolute truth. Even though I'm wise men from the East. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is from the wise men from the East. Yeah, the, the, no, my, my, my question is, yeah. Right, 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 right. I mean, you know, God is like an ocean. And what we know about God is probably the cup of the water. And some people have a bigger cup. Some people have a probably a smaller cup. But it's a still cup of the water. But, but we argue back and forth based on what we know, you know. And uh, situations like that, to me, it is great opportunity to share our belief. You know, they are in our home. They are in our house. They are captive audience, amen? You know, we don't even have to reach them, you know. They are here, in our own territory, our own building. And, and building relationship with them over the years, the way we treat them, you know, how the, the, you know, uh, we share this you know, blessing in our uh, uh, building. And, 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 and when you begin to earn the right, the, you know, uh, uh, and the, on the privilege to share the truth. The time will come. Because I heard many times, the time will come. And then you have a greater opportunity to share. Uh, but rather than, rather than you know, uh, um, being patient with His grace and mercy, you know, we tend to just convict people, you know. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the challenge that we face. Anyway, here, determined to success. So this is the thing. Uh, but when we say determined to uh, uh, determine success, it's basically uh, being faithful. But in Christianity, there is no such a thing as a successful life. 
Christianity is about being faithful. When we are faithful to his calling and commission and command, we will be successful at the end. Amen. But sometimes we just focus on being successful rather than being faithful. And, and the, you know it, the word, you know, God is faithful in 1 Corinthians, that root word, that the faithful is what? Commitment. So God is committed to be faithful. So, so we have to, really, commit it to you know, uh, uh, his calling and his commission and his command. We have to be faithful. We have to be committed. This is why I don't really believe in this come and see type of uh, passive mentality. When you have that come and see mentality, it's all about having self-glorifying worship service. And this is why people complain about the music or pastor sermon. Because they're not worshiping God anymore. You know, it's all about my satisfaction. And then we see people at the community as a fishing pools. We don't even see people as a precious souls that God is concerned of. We see people as a prospects of a church membership growth. And, and congregation, that's all we care about. These four walls of the church, this is a holy ground. You know, no one touches. It's like, you know, uh, I mean, the, the wrong attitude. The Christianity is not about, you know, uh, you, you, your, your church, your church membership. It's about come and be with me. This is why we have to make a transition from here to there. You know, discipleship and the community transformation and the world mission. How do you make that? It, it, this is the transitional right here. Come and follow me. People have to be engaged in small group, and uh, you have to have diversified the ministries. And more people are engaged and involved, you will have an active congregation, and then begin to see the importance of you know the, the bigger picture that we are you know uh, uh, responsible with. Does that make sense to you? Any question? We okay. I'm spending much of the time today. You know why we have to do this. And tomorrow I will spend you know, uh, most of the day talking about what are the things that we can do, those uh, uh, models and the strategies. And then the Wednesday we'll talk about how to do it. I will talk about implementation you know, strategies. Because I don't want to just go directly to the application without you know, having a firm foundation. You know, and we will go home and, and yeah, we just had a 1 plus 1 equal 2 in you know, a mathematical uh, 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 lesson. So here we go. Holistic ministry, again, uh, dear sister back there mentioned about this earlier. The importance of community outreach ministry, you have to approach them with this mindset, holistic. You know, I know some of the churches like to use W in front of H, especially medical you know, uh, 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 institutions like to use W on it. Because uh, 1970s, the New Age movement you know, they begin to uh, uh, capitalize on this word holistic with the H on it. And uh, so people think that, you know, holistic with the H associated with New Age movement. So they put W on it, the whole person. And that, that word is not even the dictionary. But th th this is how we are. This, th this is how, so b because, we, you know, we see things, we go, all, you know, totally opposite direction. Even though that is not biblical. But anyway, e even you know, New Age people got the <laughs> biblical understanding, holistic. It's the physical, social, mental, and spiritual well-being. So we must see people as a precious soul that God is concerned with and instead of a prospects of a church membership. So this is the thing right here. Uh, one of the uh, primary examples, Matthew 4. You know, we always use this you know, uh, uh, the words of Jesus, I will make you fishers of men. And, and we focus on you being an you know, outstanding fisher, outstanding you know, uh, uh, salesperson of the uh, denomination, you know, obtaining a skill set. How can I preach and teach and give a Bible study and so forth? But no, what Jesus is saying, it's not about you. You, you, is, you are not the focus of this. The people are. Jesus is saying, literally, in Greek, I'm going to teach you how to fish for people. 
You getting it? So Jesus is saying, I'm going to teach you a skill set that you need to fish for people. Here's, a, here's my argument in, in the uh, graphic uh, illustration. Please forgive me. I'm not an uh, artist. I will never be a good artist. Um, I'm a torturer. That's my spiritual gift. I torture people. And, uh, and the pastors, it's, it's very difficult to listen. You know, it's a couple of hours. Uh, anyway, listen, this, this is fish. Okay? Okay, this is fish. Uh, it's vegetarian fish. This is why it's so healthy looking. All right, here we go. And, and this, this is the, uh, the boat. Oh, how many of you have been to uh, uh, Galilee? Hey, good for you. Don't, don't you sponsor pastors to go to Galilee, sir? This conference? The Holy, Holy, Holy Land Tour? You, you, you know, you should do this. I mean, could that? You really have to, you know. Yeah, yeah I mean, I will go with you. Where, 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 when you go as a conference, invite me. I'll go with you. You know, because you got to go. I mean, really, seriously, you have to go see and walk the, you know, the roads that Jesus walked. You know, you have to go to Gethsemane where Jesus wept. You have to see that, you know. Yeah, I mean, seriously. And, and this is the Galilee. And the, as you know, the Sea of Galilee is like uh, uh, Lake Michigan. It's, you don't see the end, you know. Uh, it's Lake Tao, do you see end from one end to the other? It's, you, you can see the, the land out there, other side? Okay. Yeah, the, the, Gal yeah, the Galilee, uh, you don't see the end. It's like an ocean. But, uh, you know, the weather changes all the time and the crazy <laughs> place. But anyway, it's a net fishing. Um, you cast out net. The boat they use at during that time is not the boat that, that you, you think of today. <laughs> and it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting looking you know, boat. And uh, when you cast out the net, when you pull over, you, when you do that by yourself, your boat will tip over easily, the way it is designed. So, you have to really go out two or three boats, you know, working together. You cast out net, and these these three boats pull the nets opposite direction, so they can, you know, uh, pull the you know the net collectively. So that's kind of setting. And here, fishers they bring fish to the market. This is a market that where people can come and and sell and buy, and people with the access, the resources. This is it. But also, they set aside the fish that are not marketable. Mm -hmm. Head is chopped up, side is opened. You know, people, you know, with the resources, they will not buy those kind of fish. Who, who would like to buy defective fish, right? No, I don't. So they set aside those fish for community people we call least of these. Orphans, widows, prostitutes, Gentiles, Lepers, people who cannot go to this regular market, they come here. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to teach you how to fish for all people. All people in our community, especially people who are disassociated, disenfranchised, disconnected. Does that make sense? So we as church, we cannot just focus on least of these. We have to look at also a fluent community too. Sometimes that's all we focus on. We focus on in a list of these and, and, and forget about you know, a fluent community. That is wrong. We have to see all people in our community. People in a fluent community financially may not the challenge, but hey, they have a problem too. Divorce, substance abuse, yeah, I mean, you know, marriage, marriage is falling apart. Lots of problems out there. Health and children, yeah, parenting issues. So, we as a church, we have to have a diversified ministry to serving all people in our community. Amen? Amen. But sometimes, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I, uh, we, we don't see, we don't approach a full-on community. That was the Manila in 2014, they were trying to reach top 5% of the affluent community in Manila. Because uh, sometimes we only reach out to you know, farmers, you know, mid lower you know, income. Uh, I mean, they, they need the gospel too. I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that is wrong. But 
we have to see all people and we have to provide diversified ministry to, to you know, uh, engage with the entire community. Amen? What is the word that you're using there? Is it afterwards or afterwards? I'm sorry, by the way. I'm, I'm not getting it. Both. Both. We have to be in the presence of God. Yeah. And we have to be in the presence of God. Reach out to the affluent community. Oh, okay. Yeah. People with you know, the resources. Yeah. People in high powers. Yeah. We have to. But somehow, uh, we don't do well with that part. We don't even know how to deal with those uh, members of our church. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was being cynical. Um, First Peter, chapter 2, it said, We are chosen people and the royal priesthood. You know, when you look at the Old Testament, there are three types of leaders. First king, second prophet, third priest. These are the, you know, the rulers. Uh, of the nation. But God has not called us to be a king. He's not calling you to be a prophet or prophetess, but he is calling us to be priest. The priest, by definition, we only do two things. Serve God, serve his people. That is why we do what we do. We are here to serve. We are, we are servants of God. But somehow we prefer to be, you know, the king and the judge and the prophet and you know telling people wrong and so forth <laughs> this is why Ellen Joy remind, he's reminding us kneeling in faith at the foot of the cross he has reached the highest place to which man can attain we as the sinners we as mankind we as the sinners the highest place that we can attain the rich it's not the, you know, uh, conference president or union or division or the institutional leadership. No, it is at the foot of the cross. And that has to be happen every day. In fact, every moment of our decisions and life. Amen? Amen. Uh, then people will begin to follow. Sometimes we don't have a servant's heart. And attitude. When you don't have a servant's heart and attitude, not only you'll be danger to yourself, but you'll be danger to others and the church. Chuck Swindle said, "Churches are full of sleepy saints who are merely lagging time in God's family, not knowing what to do with the current life, but wants to live forever." That happens so many times. So, this is why I, I, I'm convinced that we cannot focus on, you know, uh, being an attractional church. Uh, if you build it, they will come, you know, Kevin Costner mentality. It doesn't work. Amen? We have to go where people are. You know, I went to a church, and I'm not going to mention the name of the church. Some of you probably know this church. But anyway, they had this, you know, core values. As soon as you walk into the church, there's a big banner you know, with the name of the church, and it said core values, and uh, personal salvation, and spiritual discipline, and seeking the Lord, and worship, and becoming a devoted follower. You see anything wrong with this? No. It's a good list, right? It's, it's a very good list. I don't have any problem with that. Well, I do have a problem with that. Remember I told you I, I came from the Buddhist background? If you change one word, that Lord with Buddha, this is the very essence of a Buddhism. Sometimes we do just that. My salvation, my spiritual discipline, my character, and having a just worship. Not to worship God, but you know. So we really have to become a missional church. We have to engage with the whole community intentionally. Public sector, private sector, non-profit sector. You know, this is how you solve the problem. You know, when I was in Dayton, Ohio, I had a, a unique experience. I was a part of a, a community a, a ministerium. We had a, I mean, this, do you, you have that too here, right? San Francisco? Do you go to an area ministry? Like you hang out with the Baptist pastors and Methodist pastors and Presbyterians? You should. 
You should join with your local ministerium. You know, it's more fun, really, than sometimes you know just hang out with our own. They really challenge your worldview. They really challenge your belief. Yeah, seriously. And 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 sometimes we, we need that challenge. You know, while we while we are as uh, Seventh Adventist ministers. But anyway. Dayton really was a very unique community. Uh, this is a Cincinnati, Ohio. This is a Columbus, Ohio. This is Indiana. And this is like Chicago and Cleveland. And Cincinnati, Ohio is a mecca for homeless people. And if you are you know, uh, uh, homeless with a substance abuse, whatever the problem, if, if you want to become self-supporting, self-sufficient, within a year, a year and a half, they will you know, systematically walk you through the process and help you through like a rehab centers, job training, connect you with a job, and there's uh, a subsidized housing unit. You can stay there and transitional home, and, and then they will even help you with you know, uh, lower, uh, uh, I guess, the, uh, the, the mortgage interest to have your own place. I mean, it's really good systematic approach. And, and people love to go to Cincinnati to change their life. But it's too far to go directly from Columbus or Indiana or Chicago. So guess what? They all come to Dayton, Ohio first. You know, the transients going through our town all the time and asking every single church listed in the yellow page, asking for food, clothing, you know, gas money and place to stay. And, and the churches are bombarded with this, you know, uh, requests all the time. And uh, when I, you know, as you go to the ministry and meeting, you know, so we pray and we talk about the problems that we're dealing with. This thing comes up every month. Every time we meet, we talk about the struggle. So the wise man came from the East, had enlightened from the Lord, and shared some of the ways to deal with this thing collectively. It wasn't anything, you know, intelligent. It was common sense. Basically, what we decide to do, Presbyterian Church, Baptist Church, Mennonites, Catholic, whatever, Seventh Advent, we put you know, money into this pot, $500, $100, or whatever you can, every month, we put money into a pot. And we took that money and went to private sector, gas station, grocery store, hotels. We went there and said to them, you know, we have uh, this common problem in our community. And they're dealing with that problem too, you see? They come to grocery store and stealing things. You know, they put gas and run away. I mean, it, it's, it's everyone's problem. It's not the church problem alone. It's our community problem. So when we went there with this you know, idea, they said, oh, no problem. Let's work together. So we said, we give you a dollar. Can you give us $2 worth of service? They said, you know, we give you $5 worth of service. You know, and if you don't mind, write us a like, you know, text benefit letter. You know? Yeah, why not, right? So nonprofit church is working with a for-profit in win-win situation. We took those vouchers and went to public sector, police station and uh, 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 firemen, fire station. We took those vouchers from the private sector, went to the public and said to them, you decide how these vouchers will be distributed. So when we get phone calls, we as a church, nonprofit, we will refer them to you, policemen, firemen, you distribute. So what's happening here? All three sectors working together, right? Whole community is engaged, right? And the people who are lying, they are not going to police station and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, fire station. Because sometimes people try to take advantage of the church. They, they go hopping, church hopping. They go one church to the other, trying to get more you know, resources and money and free goods. But this way, we have control over this abuse. I and mean, even though it's a small percentage, but still, abuse is there. You know, we cannot be vulnerable, all right? Uh, so, only people who are really in need, they go to police station and the fire station and ask for those vouchers. See how it was connected? Whole community. It, it, I mean, yeah, it was common sense, more likely, really. The problem was, everyone was thinking about what my church can do. You see? It was the individual approach rather than collective impact. What we can do as a community as a whole, you see? That's the mindset we need to challenge our people. We have to see the whole community, not just my congregation, you know, what we can do. 
we as whole community can do it. That's the focus here. Then there are greater solutions out there, greater possibilities out there. Like I said, you, there's nothing wrong with the partnering with the private sector and public sector, amen? It's okay to work with the other denominations. And Adventist Church became very appreciative with that challenge. Even Mayor came to the church and gave nice proclamation for that, you know, recommendation you made. I mean, thanks to the Lord. Change your mindset from my church to our community. And this is the General Conference Tell the World Initiative. You know, even though General Conference came up with, remember that 2005 General Conference came up with a seven initiative? People, some of you know that, right? I hope so. <laughs> and, and we don't remember what those sevens are. So they said, okay, we're gonna make the three, the five, seven into three. So they come up with this rich, rich up, rich out, rich across. And uh, so I, you know, I, I really think we need to uh, uh, be serious about the making that happen. So when we change our mindset and perspective, our choices will lead to a different action. Difference making actions will lead to difference making practices. And difference making practices will lead to difference making habits. And habits lead to character. And our you know, difference making character will create faithful presence in our community. That's the key factor here. Faithful. Faithful presence. Not just showing up once a year with the empty can and asking for money. But that day, I mean, that days are over. I'm sorry, my brothers and sisters. You know, some of you probably remember the ingathering days. Yeah. But you know, the problem with us was, you know, uh, we go to people once a year with an empty can and, and asking for their contribution. But until next year, there's no connection, no follow up. We don't come back with any report what we have done with their contribution. And then, then what would we wonder why people don't give to us anymore. Hello? I mean, what have, we, what have we done with that? Seriously. Pay for our summer school expenditures, you know, subsidy, school subsidies, more likely. We have not done well for community benefits. This is why I, I'm very adamant about being intentionally engaged. This is the Paradise Fair Church. If you have time to go visit, San Diego sometime, please stop by this church. As you walk into the church, you will see it. It's a bringing hope to our community. That's their slogan. And uh, they contact the local uh, uh, college, community college nursing program. They provide like twice a week, you know, the, the basic health, you know, and then nurses, that actually students in nursing program get their uh, credit for uh, practicum. Because they have to do so many hours, you know, of a practicum. And, they get credit for, and clothing, food, and they do daycare. Community garden is a big thing. I don't know whether you remember, there was a lady from uh, Ghana, 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 and uh, the lady was in pink dress by herself, and she was a suicidal. Because she came by, here by, by herself. She got separated from the refugee camp, from her family, her, her husband and the children. So she came here and, and alone, and she was depressed. And she was very suicidal, but she heard about this community garden and she started coming because she, she had a nice garden back home and so she kind of reminded, it was a therapeutic, but she soon began to interact with the church members and the community people. Depression solved. She's a baptized member. Husband came later, she said, you come in with me to this church. Husband is baptized, you know, yeah. And English was second language, you know, English, English is the fourth language for me. You know, I speak Korean and English and good language and bad language. Um, when people come to this country as, a, as an immigrant and a refugee, hey, you got to learn English, amen? And why not? You know, pro they, they provide 38 hours of language course, you know, uh, 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 day and night. And with this, uh, what do you call that, Rosetta Stone? Yeah, the software, yeah, and, and they do that. And then the refugees have to have a job experience, so they open up a food ministry. And now they, this is about a, a 500 square foot building, but now they're trying to buy a 2,000 square foot building because it, it, it's, it's growing. The community 
people you know, uh, with the resources, they love to donate to the church because they understand 100% of the proceeds are directly you know, benefiting the refugees and the immigrants in, our in, the, in this community. So, and then, of course, they got this transportation. You remember that, the blue van? And they got a white van and also yellow, school yellow, uh, 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 three transportation. They provide for refugees. And some people, you know, you come and, and the public transportation is not always readily available. And they have to go to work, they have to go to school. And so they're providing a transportation. So this is a Peggy, uh, uh, Pastor uh, Will James and Mrs. James. Maybe at the workers' meeting, you should, you should invite him, sir, and uh, ask him to share in a wonderful experience. And we have this church like this in you know, many places. Uh, British Columbia, uh, Elder Grove, uh, they do acts of kindness in the, the, the Canada, similar situation. And uh, uh, Canada and also New York and so forth. Anyway, B. Hybels, he said, Christ through the church is the hope of the world and the servants are the hope of the kingdom of God. Amen? Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, the Christian life is not adding Jesus to one's own way of life, but renouncing their personal way of life for his, and being willing to pay whatever cost may they require. But sometimes we just don't want to pay the cost of the discipleship. I was talking to one of the church members who is a dentist, and we want to do a dental clinic you know, after, uh, uh, um, after uh, uh, afternoon, because there's a Seratos church, Korean church, they did it, uh, 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 they started a, a dental clinic after you know, service hour, and then now they have actually you know, a separate dental uh, clinic uh, ministry outside of, in the city, near the church. But anyway, we want to do something like that, and they're talking to the you know, uh, uh, church member who is a dentist. And you know what he said to me? He said, son, I'm really busy. I work like you know, 40, 50 hours, and uh, I mean, just coming to the church is, is commitment. Don't ask me anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, just come to the church, it's a serious commitment. Don't ask me anything else. Yeah. He is not a disciple. I'm, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, I, mean, I say this discreetly, you know, I'm not judging him, but uh, his priority is all mixed up. <laughs> his, his life is about just being a dentist, yeah. you know. And, and, and he forgot about his being first, foremost, disciple. He has to be a disciple first, then dentist. Yeah. But he's a den dentist, period. And I, I, I still talk to him. I still struggle with him. I'm trying to uh, you know, uh, hit him with a you know, big, big holy Bible so one day he can wake up and smell the hummus. But... Uh, <laughs> uh, second generation. Second generation. You know, I, I asked you that question yeah. because um, I've heard that sometimes with, uh, with people who are early in their walk with God, yeah. that just coming to church is, mm. you know, they're just working on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 I hear it, yeah, I hear it. I mean, I, I was converted too, so yeah, I, I know what you mean. But I'm basically just kind of using his, you know, environment as a, um, as kind of a uh, uh, talking point. We gotta do more than just maximizing my pleasure and, and minimizing my pain, amen? We just cannot, you know, uh, content with my own life and be happy. That's, that's, that's not Christianity. This is why Galatians chapter 2, 20, this is one of my favorite ones. I have been crucified with Christ and I will no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Matthew 25, Jesus is not asking us to define 2300 days chart. I'm sorry, I wish that's the case. I can recite 2300 days chart without <coughs> any hesitation. I can define all the symbols and, uh, you know, uh, Daniel 7, 11, 12, I got it. I can do it. I don't need any notes. But Jesus is asking none of those questions. He's asking simply, how did you respond to my gospel? What have you done 
with the good news. And I think that's the kind of wake-up call that we need to be serious about it. We have to equip our church members to be missionary in this world. And missionary is not just going to overseas. You, you are missionary in this community. It's a 223, sir. I trying to I trying to say something. No. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. It's made up that 20 minutes that they missed when they came late. Okay, so you need to finish finish in at 2:30. 2:30 would be good. 2:30, okay. I'm finishing 2:30. Sounds good. So we need to equip our church members to be a missionary in this world. Amen. In our own community, at their home, at their work, you know, and also we need to equip them to become faithful servants, you know, the priest to serve God and his people, and also difference makers. You know, if we, if we don't, I tell you, this is my, my you know, personal burden. You know, our North American division, the median age is like 56. It means we have a whole lot of, you know, the mature people here and the, the younger people. 30s and 40s are not in the church. This is why we have a you know, high median age. And now we are beginning to lose 20s in the church. Because we are not, you know, challenging them. Being missionary, faithful servants, and, and the difference makers. All we care sometimes is just trying to, you know, protect them so they will not commit sin or, or just come to the church on Sabbath and keep the Sabbath holy. got to be more than that. Amen? Amen. And uh, this, this is the, uh, uh, another you know, thought. It was a paraphrase of the Great Commission. It said, go, do what I have taught you to do. Teach what I have taught you to teach. Act as I have taught you to act. And love as I have shown you to love. Build my kingdom in all nations. This is what you were made to do. And I, I wish you would take this you know, calling, commission, and commandment seriously and, and begin to challenge our church members with the conviction that we, we have to make a difference. Because we are Adventist. Amen. We are Adventist. Amen? Amen. Amen. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. It's true that we did no follow-up and so on, and they would just see us appear again the following year. But as I think back on it, uh, those of us who participated in, in, in gathering mm -hmm. are the ones who are still in the church. I wonder if there's some sort of relationship between understanding my place is, is in the church, it's to connect with the, the uh, not just with the community of faith, but the world. And that somehow that translated beyond in gathering into life. In fact, a friend of mine, and, uh, the Dr. Rhonda Whitney, we studied together at the Andrews for PhD. Her dissertation was just that. She she was in, uh, she was studying uh, the how exactly how many hundreds of churches in Oregon Conference. That was it. Oregon Conference churches, and the survey was basically uh, percentage of church members who are engaged and. Uh, percentage of church members actively involved the community in engagement and the retention rate of the church membership. She was trying to correlate it. And basically her idea was, uh, her hypothesis was, if you are engaged with a community outreach, you know, more likely you will stay in the church and be involved and, you know, yeah. And yeah, her hypothesis was proved. The churches that are not engaged, they have a lesser membership, you know, uh, I was so to say this more problem, more conflict, in internal conflict. Churches that are more engaged in the community had a greater membership with uh, uh, lesser. I mean, they still have a problem. We are all sinners. We will always have a problem, but they had a lesser conflict than, you know, people, churches that are not engaged. So that was actually good. You can actually contact her and ask for a copy. You can go to Andrew's, actually search her. Rhonda Whitney. Rhonda Whitney. So that was a good study. And you're right about that one. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, I have a question about mm -hmm. the church that you were talking about in mm -hmm. the 
beginning of mm-hmm. this session, mm-hmm. you know how the church who was doing the uh, helping the refugees and mm-hmm. immigrants, and yeah, yeah, yeah. they baptized so many people, yeah, like three yeah. hundred fifty people. Yeah, last five years. Five years yeah, last right. two years about a hundred. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's an awesome thing. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to be a legalistic or yeah, anything sure. like that, but I felt like you know when we help people, mm-hmm. okay, people are being helped. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they feel good. They mm-hmm. very thankful, but. Mm-hmm. It's kind of hard for me to mm-hmm. imagine that every single one of them mm-hmm. are going to say, "Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, up, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give up jewelry. I'm going to give up this and that. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to be Adventist, right? right?" So when it comes to it, like, I don't want to call it quality control, mm-hmm. but like, how does it yeah. affect? And if you have a whole bunch of new people mm-hmm. who maybe you know Adventist to mm-hmm. a certain degree, but not culturally and everything, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying that's the most important mm-hmm. thing either. But what's the yeah. effect, or like, yeah. how how did it work on that part? I was just curious. It, it's it's the uh, quite unique in our uh, church with all these multiple cultures. They have like uh, seventeen different nationalities, and, uh, and like I said, the, the sermon is translated seven different languages. So we're talking about you know the value colliding you know all the time because some culture re- wedding band is okay, some culture is not. Some culture, females have to wear dress, long dress on Sabbath. You cannot wear pants. Some cultures, pants are okay on Sabbath. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you, yeah, you can see it. So which, which is Adventism? You know, and so they struggle with that issue. You, you had a comment on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I think yeah. one of the things that we sometimes forget about when we talk about community service is that uh, a, key imp- a key component of community service is even as why you said, do as I have told you to do, right. teach as I have taught you to teach. Yeah. Sometimes if we forget that our members aren't learning what Christ taught them right. to learn. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no initial discipleship of our members. Right. And so therefore, when new people come in, the love for the community isn't there because mm. the love of God hasn't transformed their lives yet. Mm. You know, this is actually what happened when I went to Romania a number of years ago with my wife. And the Saturday afternoon, you know, after popular, we were supposed to have some, you know, more training going on, you know, workshops. And I saw a bunch of youth out there playing soccer. Football, real soccer, you know? Yeah, the real thing. By the way, you know, the American, uh, yeah, yeah, American football is for sissies. You know, soccer is for men. Rugby is for men. I mean, you know, anyway, I mean, yeah, yeah, soccer is for boys. But anyway, uh, uh, yeah, the women, we went there, they were playing soccer. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so, so in, in my, you know, the Korean American Adventist culture, in a, we don't play soccer on Saturday afternoon. I don't know. Yeah, for Europeans. But, well, yeah, you cannot sweat. Yeah, yeah, you cannot sweat on Saturday. That, 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 that's what they. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the thing was, let, let me let me point this one out. Like, the thing was, I was kind of surprised. Then Pastor enlightened me with wonderful background that I was totally blown blown away. He said, "You see all those uh, kids out there? Two thirds of them are not Adventist." I said, okay, but they were at the church, yeah. This, they have youth program. They meet twice a week after school. They hang out, they, they have this you know, uh, uh, the youth program. They hang out, they, they meet, and they invite them to church on Sabbath. <laughs> and they have a worship service and potluck in the afternoon, they have this in you know, a game. Now tell me, what percentage of our youth invite their students, their, their peers from the school to come to church and worship together. Yeah, seriously. But they have this youth program twice a week. They meet and hang out and you know, share the good news and then invite them to the church and... Yeah, I said, praise the Lord. Amen? Amen? Yeah, I mean... So, I don't know what is Adventist, really. You know, sometimes... And I, I think that is more important than being a Christian. But uh, um, I know some, someone was like, who was that? Uh, uh, 
there was like argue when, when the review is that uh, which is most important, being a Christian first or Adventist first? You know, it was an argument in the review some time ago, uh, arguing back and forth. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's inevitable. We, we, we do struggle with that. But the most important thing is we see people as a precious soul that God is concerned, uh, concerned with. That is the most important part. If we don't see people, you know, as a precious soul, then we're in trouble. Because we only see people as prospects. Yeah. That's why we need to begin at home. Yeah. We cannot be an effective missionary out there if our homes are not even founded yeah. on the land. Right, so, right. You know, we always have to engage at home and worship. Absolutely, sir. So if you sir. look around us today, if you look at these people who come to all these different types of of, of missions, they are the people that are in home. My children went to an uh, 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 Adventist institution. I mean, my daughter graduated from you know, K-12, and my son is in 10th. Uh, last year, at the Bible class, they said, what percentage of uh, are you have a family worship service? Less than a five raised their hand. Serious problem here. Yeah. But having, before being a pastor, being a lay person, mm-hmm. coming into the ministry, working as a pastor, um, it starts at the top. Mm-hmm. We have to value mm-hmm. our leadership. Mm-hmm. We have to treat them even when they act not like Christians, or we think they're not acting like mm-hmm. a Christian, to treat them with love and respect. Mm-hmm. Because the reality is, your church will begin to look like whoever their leader is. Mm-hmm. So if, you've been, if, if I've been at my church for like five years, mm-hmm. there's a good chance that the problems I see are directly related to the problems I have. Right. And so the love has to start from the pastor. Absolutely. And then it comes. Transpires. To, yeah, yeah. You know, Jesus was like, come follow me. Mm-hmm. See what I do. Do what I do. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's really the key is is the pastor mirroring that, and and, and that includes loving and being honest. Right. Yeah. That, those aren't those are not opposites. And I think that's the second be very challenging. Sure. Sure. Um, but I just. But we do have a greater responsibility. Yeah. As a leader, the model in the way. Yeah. I'm going to say greater responsibility. Right. Because it's a priesthood of all believers, mm. but it's nevertheless it starts with the person who's being held out and who's up on that pulpit right, right. Every, every morning. Yeah, like it or not, yeah. people do look after you. Yeah, you have greater influence. Yeah, yeah and you I, do. Because when we're in the board meeting, yeah. when we are saying, hey, we want our church to do something. <laughs> Pastor Stevens said, time out, time out. Oh, okay. Yeah. I would say time out for her. Yeah, oh. yeah time out for me. <laughs> she said, time out for me. <laughs> she, he acts like my wife <laughs> every time I preach. How we treat people in our board meetings and in our oh, interaction, yeah. we want to change the structure of our church yeah. and implement a new project. We've got to mirror that people before yeah. things, even when we want to change the things to make them better. In our Darwinism, evolutionists say we are a product of a matter plus time plus chance. This is my conclusion of evolution. And uh, sometimes we treat people like that. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. So we need to stop doing it. We have a great time. Yeah. What do you want to do tomorrow? If we started 10 sharp, some point you ended 2 sharp. Because you tend to 2. And, and, and then we have lunch between, sir? Well, yeah, we got to have a lunch period in there. So, um, and, and if you want to, we can even, we can even engender a conversation around the dinner, dinner table. Oh, or lunch hour. Yeah, but, but the idea is, let's get here at 10 o'clock, and then we get out here at 2, so you, don't, so you won't have to manage the traffic so, so seriously going home. The traffic stops at 2 o'clock? Okay, you got to get home with the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so the idea is that we're, we're, let's, let's really work hard at setting your clock back by 30 minutes. So you think you're getting up at 7, but you wouldn't get up at 6.30. So you'd be here at 10. That make sense? That's being facetious. I'm, I'm, here, I'm here to serve. And I, you know, I get up at 3 o'clock. I'm from the East. 
Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so thank you, thank you guys and ladies and guys and whatever for being here. Let's, it's going to get really, really serious on tomorrow and the next day as we start seeing how, how we make these principles fit into our collective ministry. And, and that's what it's really all about. The questions we're having here, I guarantee you, are, are laying on our having them and having, having more of them. And we need to be able to get the good answers so that we can move out and do something serious for the Lord. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow, sharp. We should be okay. going from 10 to 2, two tomorrow, okay? I'm going to be here at 8.30. Yeah, Wanda was so excited. She had at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Song? Song? Yes, sir. Uh, in order for us to roll, you, you got to...